juntémonos y sigamos con esperanza defendiendo y cuidando la sangre de la tierra y de sus espíritus. Dedico este premio a todas las rebeldías, a mi madre, al pueblo lenca, a Río Blanco, al Copín, a las y los mártires por la defensa de los bienes de la naturaleza. Muchas gracias. Born on March the 4th, 1971, in the town of La Esperanza, Honduras, located in Central America. Winner of the Goldman Prize in 2015 for her work in protesting the Aguazaca Dam project, which threatened to cripple the water supplies to the indigenous Lenca people in the local area, as well as defeating several mining and logging operations planned for similar areas. Killed by an unspecified number of assailants in her own home on March the 3rd, 2016. This is the premise of an article from The Guardian that came up in my Twitter feed early last month, and I found it interesting because of what I'd been reading recently on the concept of assassination. Your you see, according to the article, the local authorities claim that Berta was killed in an attempted robbery. In a related article by BBC News, they also claim to have arrested a man and a minor belonging to an organization founded by Berta, who they say are responsible for the murder. Of course, no one who has a remote connection to Berta believes this. Her close family and friends believe that the kill was sanctioned by governmental and or corporate forces in order to get her out of the way for future development projects, calling it an assassination. The fact that Berta had received rape and death threats previously, and that between 2010 and 2014, 101 activists have been killed in Honduras, according to Global Witness, means that this isn't an unreasonable assumption. After reading some scholarly articles written by Breno Torgler and Bruno Frey in 2012, as well as Robert Fine's commentary on the paper Assassins of Rulers, written by Arthur MacDonald in 1912, I started thinking about the nature of assassination. But first, let's take a quick look at the history. The word assassin has several possible etymological origins, but all of them point to a group which operated in an area from Iran to Turkey between the 11th and 13th centuries, the same period of time as the Crusades. This group, led by Hassan ibn al-Sabah, an Aziri Shiite missionary who later became known as Sheikh el-Jabal, the Mountain Lord, was well known for stealthily approaching and publicly killing off high-ranking and heavily guarded adversaries. Some called them the Hashashin, which was a derogatory term used by their enemies for their use of their marijuana-esque drug called hash in their recruitment and preparatory rituals. Breathe. Others called them al assassiyut which came from one of the names of their first stronghold, Al-Assas, the foundation. However, it is more commonly known today as Alamut, the eagle's nest. The historic origin of the word is important because it helps to illustrate how and why assassinations have been carried out throughout history. You see, in modern times the assassin is typically portrayed as the professional killer. Not like a soldier who protects to kill their country, or the madman who sneaks a gun into a school and opens fire, but one who kills only specific people because they feel that these people need to die for things to change, or they were simply paid enough. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm a... Yeah. Not a crazed gunman, Dad. I'm an assassin. What the difference be? And one has a job and the other's mental sickness. History and academia, on the other hand, paint a slightly different picture. The assassin, according to them, is usually more of a political activist or extremist, who often has no intention of getting away with their murder cleanly, but instead seeks infamy for their actions. The assassins of rulers do not usually proceed in a sudden and blind way like the insane, but their assaults are generally logically conceived and premeditated. This much hasn't changed, and Berta's case certainly testifies for this, as there was only one witness, fellow activist Gustavo Castro Sovo, who managed to survive the attack by playing dead. The killers likely thought that Berta would be alone, or that they could easily kill Gustavo as well. The attack was certainly premeditated. And while it's important to note that 
Berta was certainly not royalty or a governmental figure, she could still be considered a leading figure for the activists in Honduras, which is why I bring up the point. Where the difference truly comes in is the fact that the killers did not seek notoriety for their accomplishment, as MacDonald and Fine attest is a driving motivation for co that is common among assassins and would-be assassins. Because the motivations for political figures are usually either political or religious, many assassins and would-be assassins consider themselves justified in their efforts and seek recognition for them. Yet, Berta's killers were focused on stealth not just in their approach to their target, but in leaving as well. What this may show is that money was involved, and so the killers wanted not only to kill their target, but to get out freely and enjoy the rewards of doing so. This crosses the border between what is typically defined as an assassin by academia and what could be called a mercenary. While this isn't as well documented in scholarly articles, or at least the ones that I could find, but it is fairly common in modern fictional portrayals of assassins. Academia tends to focus more on the assassination of governmental and royal figures as opposed to the killing of opinion leaders, with a few exceptions, such as the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi by Nathuram Godse in 1948. This is important because one of the main points made by Torgler and Frey is that reducing the expected benefits for assassinations is more effective than deterrence with threats of prison sentences or similar punishments. Togler and Frey argue that the threat of political assassination against rulers rises when the masses feel that they are being repressed from speaking out in favour of their beliefs and opinions. It's essentially a form of political activism, and that strategies including power decentralisation and tackling income inequality cut off that extremist action at the roots by denying the would-be assassins adequate justification. While they write about increasing governmental accountability and transparency, how exactly does this apply to Berta? who is not only suspected to have been killed by the very powers Togler and Frey talk about protecting, but was representative of the many strategies that they suggested deterred assassination attempts. Well, while their examples simply don't stand up, I don't believe that it's because the premise of their argument doesn't stand up. Assuming that Berta was in fact assassinated by governmental or corporate powers, it stands to reason that changing governmental policy would not have removed the justification for killing her. She was an environmental activist, and it's likely that the primary motive behind the assassination was money. So, using Torglin Frey's principle, and keeping in mind MacDonald and Fine's argument that assassins are not irrational, we can determine a possible solution to stemming the continued violence against activists in Honduras. Simply put, international involvement in not only creating environmentally sustainable projects that don't encroach on the Lenka people, but educating the people about the job opportunities that they would provide and the economic benefits that those projects would bring to Honduras would likely reduce the number of activists killed. 